I Hate the News is the weekly news bulletin from I Hate Politics podcast, a show about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Daskupta. The week of October 8th, 2024, a year after the October 7th attack by Hamas on Israel and the subsequent war in Gaza and Lebanon, American institutions, American Jewish institutions struggle with divisions. Zoning reform is on the agenda in Montgomery County and in many other local jurisdictions, but the usual incrementalist approach is politically limiting. And with less than 30 days to go to the November 5th elections, we have Hilberto Zelaya from the Montgomery County Board of Elections. Stay with us. I Hate Politics is brought to you by UMBC's political science program. If your goal is to make a meaningful impact with a career in local, state, or federal government, discover what this degree can do for you. Learn more at shadygrove.umbc.edu. I Hate Politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians, but no matter how much we may hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society functioning precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. Music for this episode comes from Washington, D.C. area post-punk rock band Grey Swift. Mike Mangiaricina on guitar and vocals. Fabrizio Cariani on guitar and backing vocals, Evan Hurd on bass, and Chris Blackburn on the drums. The songs come from their album, Closure Ends. We start today with a correction. Hi, Sunil. This is Aaron Droller from Silver Spring. I'm calling about your I Hate the News podcast dated October 1st, in which you stated that the Montgomery County Council is currently considering a plan to allow up to four units in single-family zoned areas a half mile around transit stations. The Attainable Housing Strategy's final report recommends establishing priority housing districts in which quadplexes would be allowed to be built by right a mile, not a half mile, from the transit stations. Just wanted to offer that correction. Thanks for everything you do. We love to hear from you when you like the show and when we have been remiss. If you think we got something wrong, send us a voice letter. It's easy. Record on your phone and email the file to producer at ihppod.org. Make sure to include your full name and where you live. Aaron Drolla's correction is important because there is a difference between changing zoning half mile and one mile around transit stations. How much land is being opened to increased density is critical to understanding affordable housing policy. If you want to encourage supply, making more land available for building out that supply is one central condition. The more land that becomes legally unrestricted from zoning constraints, the more developers will be incentivized to start projects so as to get their own units into the market early and capture the high prices. There is still financing to work out and long-term market trends to consider, but not only does increased land supply have to be an early step, It also reduces incentives for developers to wait for the market to rise further before starting projects. So, for example, by land value alone, Bethesda proper is more expensive to build than, say, North Bethesda and Rockville. Developers holding land rights in Bethesda proper have incentive to wait for home prices to increase further before their projects become viable. But if there is another developer just outside Bethesda proper, say in North Bethesda, where land rights are relatively cheaper, their project might pencil earlier just because the price point is lower. 
Adding a bunch of units in North Bethesda will absorb some of the demand from Bethesda proper and stabilize prices across both locations, thereby making the project in Bethesda proper less viable. So instead of waiting to put shovel in the ground, both developers will have incentive to begin their projects early. I am simplifying greatly here and stylizing the facts. Both Bethesda proper and North Bethesda would be allowed greater density under the proposed attainable housing policy. So in the real world, the footprint for upzoning has to be much bigger. At its most ambitious and hence least doable would be a regional compact across multiple jurisdictions over liberalizing zoning. No such initiative like this exists and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments has no mechanism to look at a common zoning approach across the region. There will still be other countervailing factors, but all other things being equal, the broader the upzoning, the more competitive spirit local governments can unleash. But the politics of upzoning remains about salami slicing, small bits at a time. The increase in supply is relatively small. The market absorbs the price effects, not moving dramatically enough to make upzoning a broadly resonant political argument. Advocates have largely given up on big policy change on zoning, seeing how difficult it is. But the consequence of their small ball play is what makes it harder to build a robust coalition for zoning reform. What we get instead are seething elites, compromises and carve-outs, and million-dollar condos in the place of $2 million single-family homes, which is going to happen, but it also acts as a political albatross. October 7th marked a year since Hamas attacked Israel, killing at least 1,200 and kidnapping 250 Israelis. In retaliation, Israel launched a ferocious war in Gaza, killing tens of thousands, and now the war has expanded to Lebanon, where Israeli forces are fighting Hezbollah. There are fears of a broader Middle East conflict as Iran becomes increasingly involved. The October 7th attacks and the aftermath have divided public opinion across the world and here in the U.S. We have covered various protests and demonstrations, especially on college campuses in the Washington, D.C. region. Last week, we did a story on Reform Jews for Justice, highlighting the extent to which there are now divisions that we live with. These are Reform Jews protesting the American Reform Judaism movement. Most Reform communities, who together constitute the largest number of Jews in the United States, are divided. I should add that the majority of American Jews, and hence the Union of Reform Judaism, has supported continued American help for Israel's war against Hamas and now Hezbollah. But the divisions, no matter how big or small, are unsettling communities. The University of Maryland found itself in a particular quandary. The campus chapter of the Students for Justice in Palestine asked for and was permitted to hold a vigil on campus on October 7th but a campus Jewish group applied for a competing event on the same day. University of Maryland authorities decided to limit campus demonstrations on October 7th. But the students for justice in Palestine went to the Federal District Court in Maryland, which allowed their protest on First Amendment grounds. Maryland Governor Wes Moore weighed in on the issue with a public statement criticizing the federal court's decision to allow students for justice in Palestine to move forward with their event. The University of Maryland is hardly unique among schools having to draw lines between free speech and incitement of violence, something which has never been easy to do. Which then leads us to voting for the upcoming general elections scheduled for November 5th. And for that, we have Gilberto Zelaya from the Montgomery County Board of Elections, known to most as Dr. Z. First thing is to be a registered voter. So obviously you must be 
a U.S. citizen, live in Maryland, and at least 16 years of age to pre-register, but you must be 18 by November 5th, which is the general election date. Now, the deadline to, to pre-register or the advanced voter registration deadline in Maryland is Tuesday, October 15th. We call it the advanced voter registration deadline is because we utilize that for kind of election day preparation um, as it pertains to poll workers, equipment, allocation of resources. Um, but at the same time, even if you miss that October uh, 15th deadline, uh, you can still leverage same day voter registration. Um, if you desire to vote in person at one of our 14 early voting centers from the 24th of October through the 31st of October, which is a Thursday through Thursday, including the weekend. And then the last opportunity would be on Election Day, which is Tuesday, November 5th. The easiest way to get on that voter rolls, get your cell phone and text the word vote, V-O-T-E, vote to 77788. You could also go to our website at 777votes.org and you could also apply there or download the Maryland uh, voter registration application. Now to use the online voter registration uh, link, you have to have either a valid or current Maryland driver's license, a learner's permit or an MVA ID and you will also provide the last four digits of your social security number. Now, if you don't have the three forms of ID to leverage the online Maryland voter registration link, then you could download the application from our website and you will provide on question 6B, the last four digits of your social security, you would mail that or you could deposit in one of our 58 ballot drop boxes and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then we will process that You'll get a notification and on that notification, it will tell you where you would vote or how to request a vote by mail ballot or how to uh, vote during the early voting season. You didn't say anything about mail-in ballot. What's the deadlines for those? So to request a mail-in ballot packet, which actually I have one here that looks like that. So you have the outside envelope. You will have information that gives you instructions on how to vote by mail. It also gives you a listing of all the 58 ballot drop boxes in Montgomery County, and it will give you a return envelope so you don't need to pay postage. And you got to make sure that you sign the voter oath, right? Once you voted your ballot and you insert it into, the, into this return envelope. If for whatever reason you misplace that packet, uh, you could text the word box and a zip code to 77788, and it will give you the nearest drop boxes according to that zip code and a, a USPS uh, post office locator. Um, now, if you want to do the web delivery uh, ballots, the deadline is November 1st. When you print that sheet of paper at the office or at home, you have to provide your mail uh, postage, you have to provide your envelope, you have to print your ballot and all the instructions. Make sure you return that voter oath right in that envelope. Um, what happens is when you print that sheet of paper, it's, it's going to be, you know, on the, on the regular sheet of paper, which is, you know, eight and a half by 11. But we need to duplicate that onto the official ballot because our scanners will not scan the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, even though it's printed with the contest in your selection, it won't scan. So we need to duplicate it and we will have bipartisan teams. So it's an additional step, but I do want to communicate that to you. Yes. While that is available, I just want to point out that voting officials have to manually by hand replicate your ballot. So from me, not from Gilberto Zelaya, from me, don't do it. But yes, the Maryland State Board of Elections will email you a pass, a secure password and log in. You download your ballot, you print it, you send it, etc. We got about give and take between 22 and 25,000 mail-in ballots already in the office. So you guys are doing a good job returning the ballots compared to the primary. Let's talk a little bit about what help you need in terms of volunteers. We must create bipartisan teams to run nonpartisan elections. They're transparent, they're accessible. 
Uh, you have to be a, a, a U.S. citizen and registered to vote in Maryland. So if you happen to live in Prince George's or Frederick County, we will love for you to serve. I understand that you will like to work in your neighborhoods, but we need the Montgomery County civic minded uh, registered voters to help us out on Election Day and during early voting. Where we have some deficiencies is Potomac, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, parts of Rockville, a.k.a. I think they call it North Bethesda, but kind of the Rockville area. Uh, and then also we need registered Republicans throughout the county. Uh, we need Republicans because it's the way we could create our bipartisan team, one Democrat, one Republican. And when we don't have the Republican, then we will need to fill in with a non-Dem. We're working closely with the Republican Central Committee. Actually, they've been really helpful in recruiting poll workers, uh, but we need a lot more. To apply, text the word SERVE to 77788. No more students, however. We still need students. You know, this last election in the primaries, 14% of our poll workers were high school students. And uh, very interesting, 23% of our uh, poll workers in the primaries were 25 and under. And we have the Future Vote program where we actually recruit students in high schools. We uh, introduce middle school students in the process of participatory democracy. We are the only county in the entire country that bring in students that young. They do the little incidentals, they serve as greeters, pass the I voted sticker, keep the polling room clean. They do not touch equipment. They do not touch ballots. And once they hit 16 and they meet the state requirements, we will pre-register them to vote. And then we will encourage them to serve as election workers. Middle school students or students 15 and under can earn SSL hours. Students 16 years of age or older can earn the stipend or the student service learning hours. So if you want to serve as a future voter, if you're 15 and under, Text the letters F and V to your trusty cell phone, F and V to 77788. And if you're a high school student looking for an opportunity to earn extra SSL or a little bit of cash for the, uh, you know, for the holidays, text the word serve to 77788. In the Spanish language sample ballot, there was a significant error. What was the error and what is the correction? Yes. So what occurred was in the sample ballot, um, in two parts in the English and two parts in the Spanish, the early voting dates are printed. In the Spanish, uh, where it appears on page 18, it says that early voting is from the 24th through the 31st of November. It's not November, it's not December, it's not January, it's October. It was correct on the early voting map, which is on page 22 and 23 on the headers, but it was incorrect on page 18 on the header. But one of our staff members brought it to our attention and they got reprinted, sent. Uh, you'll be getting those in the mail next week. How many wrong sample ballots were sent? So it was halted from being mailed. So we had to reprint them all. Do you know how much it, this entire reprint is going to cost? No, right now we're, we're still working with the vendors. We'll get the invoice. Right now we're focused on Election Day. Um, remember, Election Day is uh, Tuesday, November 5th. Um, also, if you want to ascertain what is your polling place, you could get your trusty cell phone and text the word CHECK to 77788. Gilberto Zelaya, thank you. My pleasure. One distinction to note, the error occurred in the sample ballot, not the actual voting ballot itself. Many homeowners associations do not allow you to put yard signs, especially political signs, even on your own property. Private bodies can limit free speech that government institutions cannot. The University of Maryland, in the example we used before, cannot be as restrictive as a private school, though most big private schools now receive significant public funding that they have to function similarly. HOAs as private bodies routinely limit freedom of speech unless they are specifically prohibited. And in 30 days before elections, they are in fact prohibited from stopping residents from displaying political signs per Maryland law. So those of you who live in HOAs who want to put out their yard signs now, it is time. Sit down. That's all for this episode. Be sure to check out our feature interview series that comes out Friday mornings. I Hate Politics is produced by me, Sunil Dasgupta, an assistant producer, Adama Gay with support from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I direct UMBC's 
Political Science Program at the Universities of Shady Grove in Montgomery County, where, among other things, we explore and learn about politics, government, and society close to home. Music for this episode comes from Washington, D.C. area post-punk rock band Grey Swift. Mike Mangiaricino on guitar and vocals. Fabrizio Cariani on guitar and backing vocals. Evan Hurd on bass. And Chris Blackburn on the drums. The songs come from their album Closure Ends. Closure Ends.